If I haven't met you yet, my name is Sam. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Capivate, but excited to be here with you. If this is your first time here, let me just say welcome. So glad you guys decided to join us today. I'd love to have the opportunity to maybe meet you afterwards. But before then, and to get things started, are you guys okay if I start with something a little controversial? We okay with that? All right. Okay, you may not like me after this, but here's my hot take. Thanksgiving is better than Christmas. Anybody? Anybody? All right, we got one, too. All right, yeah, thank you. Thank you. You know what it's about. It's hard to argue otherwise, is it not? Thanksgiving, literally the best day of the year. Like, if God came to me, he's like, you got one day to live, I'm pretending it's Thanksgiving, right? All you can eat for all day, 10 hours of football, like nonstop, and then hanging out with the people that you love. Again, this is my day. I absolutely love Thanksgiving. And it's just a day where there's, there's so much, like there's so much hope, there's so much excitement, there's so much to be grateful for, right? And that's actually the whole point of Thanksgiving, right? To, be, to practice gratitude, to give God thanks for maybe the gifts, the blessings that he's given to us in this life. And actually, Thanksgiving, it reminds me of this verse, 1 James verse 17, where the Bible, it says this, it says, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above coming from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, right? In this verse, James, he's telling us what? He's like, all the good things that you have in your life, those good, those perfect gifts, the things that we like to celebrate and thank God for one day a year, James is saying, he, God, he's the source of all of them, which is why thanksgiving and gratitude is actually the proper response as you think about whatever those good and perfect gifts might be for you in your life. If you wanna know something crazy about this verse, is if you've been here at all for the last seven weeks, you know that we just wrapped up our series, Seven Deadly Sins. It's been an amazing series, I absolutely loved it. Very convicting, very powerful, and uh, just love what God was showing us in this. But in this series, every single week, we shared with you a verse in which we thought shed light in terms of how the devil was wanting to lure you, tempt you, to actually live your life from these seven deadly sins. So again, I'm not sure if you remember this verse, but we read it every single week. And if you were here or not, we're gonna throw it up on the screen right now, but the verse was this. It was 1 James, or First James, James chapter one, there's only one James, 14 through 16. Literally the three verses that just came before the one I just read you. We're gonna read them all together right now. So in that, it says this. It says, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it's conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Do you guys remember this verse? You know, we read it pretty much every single week. And it's crazy, because again, these three verses come right before the one I just read you. They're in the same paragraph, they're in the same thought thread for James, the guy who's reading this. Again, reading it together, verse 16, it says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers, why? because every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, it's from God. Basically, I think what James, he's telling us is that as we look at all these verses together, he's pleading with us, he's like, hey, don't be deceived. Your best life, the life that you desire, the life that God has made you for, it's not gonna be a life that you stumble upon, right? As you go and you give into every desire, if you pursue every passion that you have and go after every pleasure, but James is saying that that life it's one that you already have. It's in your possession. Look, last time I, I got to speak, I shared my favorite verse in all the Bible, John 10, 10. And it's my favorite verse because in it, it's Jesus' vision, his mission, and his purpose for your life. Because in it, he says, I have come so that you have a full life. Another translation reads as abundant life. And so I'm not exactly sure if that's how you would describe your life or not. But I think James, he's speaking to that life in these verses. Again, he's saying, God, he's given us all these good and perfect gifts. Like you have them right now in your possession and unwrapping these gifts, using and stewarding the gifts that God has given you. That leads to the full life that Jesus has for you. So what are the gifts that James is talking about? Well, some really smart theologians, people who've been reading the Bible a lot longer than I have, say that we can put these gifts into one of three categories, time, treasure, and talents. The gift of time, what is that? That's your time here on earth, the years that you have. The breath in your lungs every single day, you didn't do anything to earn that, but rather it's a gift, right? <laughs> so as we steward the gift well, it helps us again step into the fullest life. Your treasure, your possessions, not just your bank account, but everything that you have within your possession, right? Believe it or not, all those things, they're actually God's and not yours. <laughs> 
And I say that with conviction because last time I checked, we all leave here with the same amount of possessions that we entered and that being nothing. So again, God, he gives you these gifts to steward well for his glory while you're here. And then finally, your talents, your skill sets, your strengths, your abilities, your spiritual giftings. Again, we didn't do anything to earn these, but rather God, he's made you in his image and he stamped his greatness on you. And that greatness, your talents, is meant to be steward to bring him glory. Again, time, treasure, and talents. We all have these, maybe to different and varying degrees, but again, these are the good and the perfect gifts that God has given to us, ones that you have in your possession right now. But guess what? I think what James, he's trying to tell us is far too often we miss out on this full life, the life that you desire, the John 10, 10 life. We miss out on that life because we begin to maybe see some of these good and perfect gifts, we take them for granted. Or maybe it even gets to the point where we see them as being meaningless. You know what happens when we see a gift as being as meaningless? We often leave it completely wrapped, right? Still underneath the tree, not even wanting to open it. And I know this because I've experienced it. Quick story for you, okay? And let me just start off with the disclaimer. I love my wife. I love my wife, okay? You might think differently after I share this story, but I promise you I do, okay? We've been married for 12 years. We have four kids, so life, it's a little crazy. And when you add like hunting, gift hunting on top of the to-do list, again, it's just a lot, okay? But again, about seven years ago, at this point in our marriage, we only had two kids. But I thought I was gonna get her the most powerful and meaningful gift for, for a Christmas gift. And so what I thought to myself is like, all right, we got a two-year-old and a one-year-old, so I'm gonna get my wife a gift that revolves around the thing that she absolutely loves in her life, and that being her kids, okay? So what did I get her? Do you guys know those kind of cheesy, personal, photo-inspired gifts that maybe you'll get a distant relative? I'm talking about like the coffee mug with your family's photo on it. Yeah, you track with me? The photo album that maybe nobody will ever look at, I don't know. Anyways, I went all in. Those were the gifts that I got. I'm like, she's gonna love this stuff. She's gonna absolutely love it. The coffee mug, the album, everything, right? The best part was, is it only took me like 15 minutes to like make and order these. So it was really convenient and easy. But let me just say, when she opened that first gift, Okay, her response was a little different than what I thought it was gonna be like. Because when she opened that coffee mug, that picture of us, she wasn't like, oh my gosh, Sam, thank you so much for this gift, this is exactly what I wanted, but rather with no words at all, literally with just a facial expression, a facial expression that probably looked like this. <laughs> Guys, I don't know if you've ever seen your wife make that face to you, especially while opening a Christmas gift, but it's not good, okay? <laughs> she was obviously mad and she didn't have to say anything. The thing is that this look, it got more and more pronounced with each gift she seemed to open, right? The photo album, her facial expression, she didn't say anything, her facial expression was like, really Sam, like if I wanna look at my kids, I gotta look down. I don't need to look at an album, <laughs> they're there, right? Or when she got to this gift, I made her a bracelet, look at this. She kept it, can you believe that? But it's got a photo of each of our kids on. By the time it got to this gift, you get no words but that facial expression. <laughs> The facial expression basically was like, seriously, Sam, seriously? Like, did your Uncle Donnie inspire you with this gift? <laughs> By the way, Uncle Donnie is a stage name for a real life person in my family who's not known for getting the best Christmas gifts, okay? Literally half used gift cards is what we've opened up from Uncle Donnie. Anyways, <laughs> the point is my wife, she was done. She didn't wanna open up the next gift, why? Because she didn't think it was worth it. She began to think that they, it was meaningless. Again, in these verses, I think James, he's pleading with us. He's saying, hey, don't be deceived, guys, because as soon as you begin to treat God's gifts, the ones that he's already given to you as meaningless, like you're no longer looking to them for your fulfillment. He's saying that those temptations, those lures the devil is gonna throw your way, the temptations to find a life outside of God, those temptations are gonna become a lot stronger. They're gonna become a lot harder to say no to. And as we've learned in the last few months, that's gonna lead to one thing, and it's not a full life, but it's a dead life. A life where sin's a constant struggle, and the good life, the good life just seems like a distant dream. Essentially, I think the best way to sum up these four verses, and what James is trying to tell us, is like this. Your gratitude for the gifts God has given you will determine your experience of the good life Jesus has for you. To me, it's crazy like how powerful gratitude is. I think, 
Again, just thanking God for what he's already given you. That could be the difference between you biting one of the lures and temptation, experiencing death, or experiencing the full life and enjoying all that God has already given you. Like, gratitude is that powerful. And the best part is, is gratitude is a choice. Right? It's not just a feeling, but it's a choice. And I know this because the Bible tells us. Actually, the Bible commands us to choose gratitude in every situation. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the ultimate thanksgiving verse, by the way, says this. It says, give thanks, okay? Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God for you. And God, he's not gonna command something that you have no control over. We don't always feel grateful, but you do have control over your choice and whether you want to give thanks or not. And I think what God, he's trying to tell us is, hey, my will for you, right? The way that you step into the good life I have for you, it's through this door of gratitude. It's by giving thanks for the good, the perfect gifts that I have already given to you. Because when you don't choose gratitude, God's gifts, they quickly become like Uncle Donnie's, right? Left underneath the tree, completely wrapped and never opened. And again, I think Jesus, he actually makes the case that if that's the way we begin to treat God's gifts to us, it's a very dangerous place for us to be. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. But essentially, I think what we see through Jesus' teaching is that these gifts that God gives to us, he gives them with the expectation that we do something with them, that we actually do exactly what he did, use them to serve other people and bring God glory. But in order to steward these gifts well, it actually requires us to take inventory, right? We have to know what we've been given. It's hard to steward something if you don't know what you actually have. And back to our present analogy, you can't use the gift until you actually open it, see what it is. And if I may be so bold to suggest from my own experience as a pastor, based on conversations I have with people every week, based on church culture today in 2022, I personally feel like there is a particular gift from God that most of us in here today will go through this life and never actually open it. Never know what they really have. And you wanna know what I think that gift from God is for most of us? The gift that tends to be left under the tree and fully wrapped? It's your spiritual gifts your spiritual gifts. Now, I'm not entirely sure what you think or feel when I say those two words, spiritual gifts, right? What's that feeling that you have in your heart right now? Maybe it's one of joy and excitement because you know what your spiritual gift is and you know the joy that comes every time that you use it for its intended purposes. But maybe you're on the other side of the feeling spectrum. Maybe your feeling, as I say those words, is more of doubt and uncertainty. Like imagine with me, God, he has this present for you. It's handed to you. It says, to you from God, your spiritual gift, is this a gift that you have opened in your life? Is this a gift that you even wanna open? Look, I think for a lot of us, we might be in this place where we've been hesitant about opening up this gift, right? So like, you know spiritual gifts that they're in the Bible, you know that they're part of church history, but you're not quite sure if they're for you, if God even has one for you. In fact, I think there is probably a good amount of in here today that maybe you've grown up in the church, you have this relationship with God for most of your life, but this topic of spiritual gifts, it's one that maybe you've avoided. Why? It seems foreign, it seems weird, right? Or maybe it seems like the only people that get those are the people with a lot of faith or the people who get a paycheck from the church, I don't know. Look, I believe there might be a lot of us in here today in regards to the topic that are exactly in that spot because that was me. That was me, that was my story. It took me nearly 30 years to unwrap God's gift to me. My goodness, and I don't wish the same upon anybody else, but if that is you, let me just say, I'm so glad that you're here today because today we're gonna unwrap that gift. And I can't wait for you to begin to step into the full life that Jesus has for you as you begin to steward and use well one of the greatest gifts you get on this side of heaven. In fact, that's why we're titling today's message, Don't Wait Till Christmas. Okay, don't wait till Christmas to open, use, and steward the spiritual gifts that God is giving to you in your life. So look, my hope for you today is that yes, you walk out of here maybe with a greater understanding of what the Bible actually tells us about spiritual gifts and their purpose in your life, but my, my, my hope is also that you walk out of here with a sense of joy, excitement, and maybe even gratitude to open up for the very first time one of the most life-giving presents God gives us in this life, and that's your spiritual gifts. So I'm excited. Are you guys ready? You ready to jump in? 
cool, let's go. We're going anyways, okay? <laughs> Spiritual gifts, it's a big topic, okay? So we got 20-ish minutes to try and tackle this really big topic. It's all throughout scripture, okay? But for our game plan today, this is how we're gonna approach it, okay? We're gonna do the three Ds. So one, we're gonna start by defining. What does the Bible actually say spiritual gifts are? What does the Bible say the purpose of spiritual gifts are? Once we do that, we're gonna move to discerning. We're asking, the question of the day is, what has God given to me? We're gonna work through that and hopefully help you discern the gift that God has given to you. And then finally, we are gonna deploy. Or how are we gonna use these gifts that God has given to us to make an impact in the world around us? So again, part one of our game plan for today is we're needing to define spiritual gifts, okay, define. So how can we be clear in defining it? The Bible doesn't actually give us a definition of spiritual gifts, right? Paul, he never writes in any of his letters, this is how we define spiritual gifts. Like that doesn't happen. But there are two Greek words in the Testament used for spiritual gifts. We're gonna throw them up on the screen right now, okay? The first one, pneumantikos. Yeah, the P silent, shark me too. I had to Google how to say that. Anyways, pneumantikos, okay? It refers actually to the source of the gifts because you can see that the word in the New Testament for Holy Spirit is pneuma, meaning pneuma is the source for this word for spiritual gifts, pneumantikos, meaning the Holy Spirit is the source for this gift. The second word for Greek in the New Testament for spiritual gifts is the word charismata. And again, this can be translated as a gift of divine grace. But just like the first word, right? The first part of charismata shows us that these gifts are granted by an act of God's grace because the Greek word for God's grace is charos. Again, the first part of the second word. So in other words, the spiritual gifts, you don't earn them, right? They're not given to you based on your abilities nor your achievements. Again, you, you can't earn these spiritual gifts. It's not like you read through the Bible in the year or you have perfect attendance at church and God's like, all right, here you go, here's another one. That's not how it works, because again, that's not how grace works. Because what is grace? I think the easiest way to define grace is like this. It's you receiving something you have not earned. You receiving something you have not earned. And if spiritual gifts are based on grace and not merit, and they come from God himself, then I think we can boldly say this. Your spiritual gifts are the best tangible evidence of God's grace in today's world. I fully believe that, why? Because we did nothing to earn them. But just like God gave his son to save the world, I think he's giving these to us to save and impact the people around you, which is crazy, right? Which is why it's important for us to open up this gift today. All right, next let's take a look at some scripture to see what the Bible says is a spiritual gift, right? There's some vagueness there. What exactly is a spiritual gift? What does it look like? So today we're gonna be jumping around a little bit. I apologize if you like to follow along in your Bible that you brought. We're gonna throw the scriptures up on the screen and be moving pretty quickly. But the first text we're gonna look at, we get seven examples, okay? Romans 12, verses six through eight, Paul, he writes this. He says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Three verses, we get seven examples from the Bible of what spiritual gifts are. Okay, we're actually gonna throw them up on the screen right now. We got a running list. There we go, prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, mercy. All these are mentioned in this first text. But there's more, okay? Here we go, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Gonna read through these real quick to add to our list. It says this, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives the message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives a great faith to another, and to someone else, the Spirit gives the gift of healing. As you see, Paul, he goes on to say that spiritual gifts also include the power to perform miracles, prophecy, discernment, speaking, and interpreting tongue. Again, all these are gifts, and then he wraps it up with verse 11. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So essentially, we got another eight examples here, meaning our list now is at a total of about 15. Okay, 15, again, practical, tangible examples. And by no means is this list exhausted, okay? There's other gifts that are mentioned throughout scripture, but the point is, is in this text, again, we get a good idea of what could be inside your present, right? The spiritual gift that God has given 
to you. And did you notice, Paul, he also gives us clarity on why God gives us these gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse seven, again, it says this, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 affirms this thought when it says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Then everything you do will bring God glory. Again, these two different texts, they show clearly why God is giving us these gifts. And it's not necessarily to bless you. <laughs> it actually will bless you as you use it for its intended purpose. But again, God, he gives us these gifts so we can bless others. Uh, it's meant to bless the people around you, the people here in the church, but also the people who are not here, right? Maybe the people who are on your corner card. And guess what? As you bless others with your gift, it's gonna bring God glory. So to wrap up, okay, stage one of our game plan today, I know we just went through a lot, but this is how I think we can define spiritual gifts based on what the Bible shows us. Spiritual gifts is this, it's the special abilities that are sourced from the Holy Spirit living within you as a means to exemplify God's grace, help others, and bring glory to God. That's our definition. So now that we've defined it, how can we discern the gift that maybe God has given to you? Because let me just say again, scriptures make it very, very clear you have this relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in you, and he's given you a gift, right? 1 Corinthians 12, 7, a spiritual gift is given to each of us. Or 1 Peter 4, God has given each of you a gift. Yeah, not my words, but the Bible, okay? So the question becomes, what gift has God given to you? Right, as you look at this present that he has before you, maybe you're shaking it. You're like wondering, God, what's in here, right? What is the present? So how can we discern? Part two of our game plan today. How can we discern, again, the gift that God has given to you? And I'm not sure where you might be out with this. Maybe you know for sure the gift that you have, the gift you've been given. Or maybe you look at that list of 15 and you're like, I have no idea, right? I have no idea, right? Maybe you just go with the one that seems like the lowest hanging fruit, like giving or serving, right? You're like, I do that sometimes, so maybe that one's it. But again, it's like no knock on giving or serving. But again, how can we actually discern the gift that God has given to us? So again, let's look at Romans 12 one more time. Romans 12, six through eight, and see if the Bible gives us any indication on how we can discern, okay, the gift that God has given to you. Again, those verses say this. It says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion, somebody say proportion. proportion. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Yeah, I'm a firm believer that the best questions lead to the best answers. So based on this text, I think the first question that we need to ask ourselves when it comes to discerning the spiritual gift that maybe God has given to you is this right here. What are you good at? Think about it. What are you good at? It may seem incredibly basic, but there's a reason again why I had everybody repeat the word proportion. Because I think what Paul is saying here is like, is that your spiritual gift is probably gonna be tied to again, something that you already do well, right? Because he's saying that if your gift is prophecy, then do it in proportion to the faith that you already have. If your gift is, is serving, then do it to your ability to serve. If it's teaching, then do it in proportion to your ability to teach. Right, so again, what are you good at? Maybe you're asking yourself, what do other people affirm that I'm good at? Like, what do they say about you? Because again, in the verse before this, Paul, he actually says, hey, don't think too highly of yourself, but rather, with sober judgment, use these gifts. In other words, again, we gotta have a proper inventory of who you are. What are your talents? What are your abilities? What are your strengths? Because discerning your gift seems to be tied to knowing how God has made you. And it makes sense, right? You're supposed to be good at your gift, why? Because it's meant to produce fruit. It's meant to produce something positive for the people around you, and it's meant to give glory to God. So what are you good at? That's the first question. The second question that I think we get from the text is this one right here, and it's when do you feel most alive? When do you feel most alive? Like what, what are you doing in those moments? In the text we just read, again, I think we can throw it up one more time just so you guys can see this, but Paul, maybe not. Paul, he equates a positive emotion in the last four examples that he gives. Okay? He, he equates those with a positive emotion. So in other words, when you're using your gift in the proper way, it's gonna feel good. 
It's gonna feel really good, trust me. In my short experience of being a pastor, for me, there's no better feeling than right now. There's no better feeling than right now. I can't tell you how much I love doing this, sharing, teaching, preaching. I absolutely love it. Like, I'm most alive when I'm up here, when I'm doing this, teaching God's word. Is it exhausting to do it for four services on the Sunday? Yes. Is it hard? Yes, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Are there moments where I doubt? Every single time. But do I feel alive when I'm doing it? Yes, more so than anything I've ever done in my entire life. And I'm telling you, you discovering this for yourself, when you finally unwrap the spiritual gift God has given you to change the world around you and to bring glory to him, there's not a better feeling in the world. Maybe the best way I can put it is like Jesus' short parable when he talks about the, the treasure in the field. What do you do when you find the treasure in the field? You sell everything to buy the field so that you can have the treasure. And I think the same is true when it comes to discovering our spiritual gifts. Look again, it's somewhat simplistic, but for me, these two questions have helped a lot be able to discern the gift that God has given me. And I think it could be helpful for you too. And again, those questions are, what are you good at? And when do you feel most alive? I think those help us discern the gift God has given to us. And then finally, now that we've defined and maybe discerned the gift that God has given to us, we're gonna talk about deploying it, right? How can we uh, use, steward, and just deploy, again, the gifts that God has given to us? And I can't stress enough how important this is because Jesus, he makes it very clear there's a big difference between you having a gift and you actually using the gift, okay? And this difference could literally be the difference between life and death. I promise you, I'm not exaggerating because Jesus tells us this in his parable of the talents, okay? It's found in Matthew 25. I so wish we had the time, but we can't read it today. But in this parable, okay, God, he gives three servants these different gifts or talents, okay? But God, he gives this gifts again with the expectation that they do something with them. Actually, God fully expects a positive return and investment for his kingdom with the things that he gives to us. And so as the story goes, two of the three servants do exactly that. They take what God has given, they, they use it, they steward it well, and they produce that positive ROI for God and his kingdom. But the third servant, the third servant, he doesn't steward it well. In fact, Jesus tells us that he buries it. <laughs> he left it underneath the tree, fully wrapped, never actually opened it, right? God not only rebukes him, but in this parable, God also seems to punish him. Look what Jesus tells us, Matthew 25, verse 30. He ends the parable with God saying this to the third servant. He says, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, <laughs> to the place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm not entirely sure what gnashing of teeth is, but it doesn't sound fun, All right? Being cast in outer darkness, no thanks, right? Again, but we got very clear indication of, of what's happening here. Jesus, he's harsh, but he's straightforward. He makes it very clear that there's a big difference between having your gift and actually using that gift. So how do we deploy it? Again, spiritual gifts, they're meant to be used for the benefit of others and to bring God glory. So step one in deploying your gift, seek opportunities to do exactly that. Seek opportunities. And to this point, let me just say, sometimes discovering opportunities to use your gift, it requires you to knock on some doors. You've been in church and any amount of time you've heard people talk this way, right? God, he's opening these doors. God, he's closing these doors. Look, let me just say from my own experience, sometimes you gotta knock before if you'll find out the door will open or not. Or in other words, seeking opportunities to use your gifts, they may not present themselves until you take a step of faith, until you put yourself out there a little bit. For me, again, teaching, preaching, love it. <laughs> love this gift, but I didn't discover it until I put myself out there took a risk, took some steps of faith. And for me, it felt like God about seven years ago was leading me to go coach high school football. <laughs> What's the connection? That led to an opportunity to serve in the local faith club at that high school, which provided me then with the opportunity to actually do this, which was teach and preach for the first time. And that led to what? That led to me discovering this desire. It then led to me seeking for more opportunities, a desire to pursue a job in ministry even though I didn't have the resume nor the experience, but I knew that God had given me this, so I wanna do anything I can to do it more. And it led to the job here, youth pastor, preaching to a crowd of four at times. <laughs> Again, if you do that, it's amazing, amazing how God will prove true to you 
When, you, when you're faithful with the little, he can give you more. And now what? I'm, he, I'm here, I'm standing on this, doing what I love, so grateful for every opportunity that I get to do it. But guess what? For you to use your gift, I think God, he will ask you to take a step of faith. In fact, if God has shown me anything about himself in my own journey, it's this right here. God is good, but he's not comfortable. God is good, but he's not comfortable. That might be another hard, hard, hot take and you might not agree with me, but I happen to believe that faith, it happens not in the midst of comfort. What I'm learning for, again from my own faith journey is that God, he often doesn't show up unless he has to, unless you absolutely need him to. We actually see this throughout the Bible. In fact, it seems most instances where God shows up, not only is comfort gone, but the devil, he seems to be celebrating. Like he's thought, he thought he has won, right? Moses at the Red Sea, Daniel in the lion den, Lazarus laying dead on his bed, Jesus on the cross. Every single one of those moments, comfort is no longer a thing, and the devil, he's taking his victory lap. But then what, boom, God, he shows up. He proves his power, his goodness, and his love. So all I'm saying is that you seeking opportunities to use your gift, more likely than not, is gonna require you to move away from comfort. Maybe the best way to say it would be like this. Using your gift will make you rely on the one who gave it to you. Using your gift will bring you to a place where you need God to show up. He's rigged it that way because he's meant to get the glory when you use it. So again, it may require you knocking on the doors to see if they open. Some may not open and that's okay, but when they do, I encourage you, run through them. Do what Jesus says, put both hands on the plow and don't even look back. Finally, the last thing I think we need to remember as we use and deploy the spiritual gifts that God has given to us is this right here, is we need to remember what the gift costs, okay? Truth is the gift is free to you, but it costs Jesus his life. And I think it's important for us to be cognitively aware of this as again, we deploy and use these gifts that God has given to us because this will do two things for you. The first one is this, is remembering the cross gives you confidence. Remembering the cross gives you confidence. Confidence in what? Confidence in the fact that the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit who now lives in you and is giving you these gifts. Like take a moment and just think about that with me, right? The God of the universe, the maker of everything, not only did he give his life for you, but he chooses to live in you. To me, it's mind blowing. I'm like, every time, like, God, why, why me? And every time it feels like he gives me the same answer, he tells me, how many times do I have to prove to you that I love you? How many times do I have to prove to you that I made you to be in this relationship with me for all of eternity? And I want you to play a role in that eternity. In deploying your gifts, it's one way that you play a role in that eternity. Deploying it with confidence though, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in you and is giving you these gifts and he's wanting to do some crazy things in your life with them. The second thing that happens when you remind yourself of the cost of the gift is this, remembering the cross gives your gift purpose. First Corinthians 12, amazing chapter that gives us some insight into what spiritual gifts actually are and look like. But first Corinthians 13 gets to the heart of why God has given us these gifts. Last verses of the day, look what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 13, one through three, it says, if I could speak in all the languages of the earth and of the angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all God's secret plans and possessed all the knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I'd be nothing. And if I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about that, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. In other words, you could have the greatest gift in all the world, a gift that's amazing, a gift that captivates, a gift that produces more fruit than any other ministry the world has ever seen. But if you miss the point of the gift, the Bible tells us it's all for nothing. Because what's the point of the amazing gift that God has given to you? It's love, love. And God, not only is he the giver of your gifts, but the Bible also tells us that God is love. First John chapter four. In other words, I think what the Bible is telling us is this, when we miss the purpose of our spiritual gifts, we miss out on the greatest gift, and that's Jesus. 
Because what does God in love actually look like? It looks like Jesus. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. You see, to give, it's synonymous with to love. Giving is synonymous with God and his nature. It's why he gave us Jesus, but it's also why he gives us these gifts to use to share with the people around you who he is and who he desires to be for them. You get to play a part in that. Isn't that amazing? Using these gifts that he's given you, not only is it how you step into the full life that God has for you, but it's how you help others do the same thing. It's how you help others to discover the life that they've been made for. One in which you're in a relationship with a God who is love, but the God who gives these amazing, but also life-giving gifts. So to close, let me just say and encourage you, don't wait any longer to open up your spiritual gift because when you do, you're gonna be amazed to see how this is the gift that just keeps giving. Keeps giving to yourself, but also keeps giving and changing the people around you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for today, Father. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that you speak to us, the way that you pursue us, this... uh, this, this life-giving relationship, Father, that we find with you, it's such a gift. But Lord, I also wanna thank you how you truly are the greatest giver. You give us things that we do not earn. <laughs> the idea of grace is even one that's hard to comprehend. But I think one of the best tangible examples of grace in this world, again, is the spiritual gifts that you give to us. So God, I wanna pray over everybody in this room, everyone who can hear me, everyone who may be watching online, that you, Father, begin to give us discernment discernment into, again, the gifts that you have freely given to us as we say yes to this relationship with you. Not only ask we ask for discernment in that, but God, I just ask that you begin to show us opportunities. I ask that you make it very clear, what are the next steps? What are the doors that I need to be knocking on, God? Seeking opportunities to actually use these gifts, <laughs> to be like the two, the two faithful servants in your parable where I use them to produce a positive return for the people around me, but mostly for, your, for you and your kingdom. So God, we just ask for clarity on that. God, we thank you in advance for just the fulfilling life that comes when we say yes to fully following you. And that includes stewarding and using well the spiritual gifts that you've given us. So God, we thank you and praise you for the time this morning. We thank you for the way that you individually speak to us. It's amazing to think that a message from a random guy on a stage and words written over a thousand years ago, you speak to our hearts and our situations today. So God, we praise you and thank you for that. But help us to leave here changed. Changed because we know that we heard from you, our Father, and birthed within this, this desire to please and to bless you with these gifts. So again, Jesus, thank you. We love you. And it's your name we pray, amen.